Well, welcome to Gov Fuller Field. We join you a bit late, but just in time for the top of the second inning. Grayson hit the left-hander for Falmouth, delivers a strike on the outside corner to Noah Ledford, the cleanup hitter and first baseman today for Chatham, with Falmouth leading this game 2 to nothing. In the bottom of the first inning, two runs on three hits. Hits delivery upstairs to Ledford, and it's 2-2. Two and two. Singles by Alex Mooney, Maui Ahuna, and Jacob Walsh, a newcomer to this lineup, help plate two. Ledford swings and misses over that pitch, and the third strikeout in the books for Grayson Hitt, Commodore left-hander making his season debut. Is through one and a third, and has struck out three of the four men he's faced. Now Adonis Herrera, the third baseman, hits with nobody on and one down. Two of the strikeouts in the first inning, Carter, came with full counts. So it was nice to see a strikeout that hit force that didn't go all the way full. First pitch to Herrera is roped very high foul right side. So to cap off that bottom of the first inning, Alex Mooney singled to lead things off, was caught stealing second. Braden Taylor hitting second, walked. Then advanced to second as hit delivers the 0-1. A line drive to right center field. Pinckney coming over to his left to make the catch. And there's two away. Five up and five down for the lefty from Alabama. And today, Pinckney in center field. The outfield a little bit different. Left to right cross factor and left. Pinckney in center. Brutcher staying in right. And then the infield, Braden Taylor, the all-star from last year, is at third. Maui Ahuna at short. Mooney at second. Walsh at first. And Grayson hit on the mound, who fires a strike, a first pitch breaking ball at 73 miles an hour to his battery mate, Angelo DeCunto. Making his catching debut this season today. Dominic Tamez, opposing catcher on Chatham, fouls that pitch off his foot, and he's now in an 0-2 hole. Yeah, DeCunto has been at first base so far this season, but we talked to him a little bit before the game, and he said he's happy to get back to his natural spot where he played at Holy Cross. So Jacob Cozart, who's caught the first three games, getting the day off, at least at first, he starts his day on the bench. 0-2, fastball up and away, and it's 1-2. and two. Looks like Hit took something off. His fastball so far in this game is clocked in at about 91. As he peers in, one strike away from Sending us to the bottom of the second. He's forced a couple of in play outs. He's looking for his fourth punchy of the day. One two pitch, and Tamez does just stay alive. Bounces it off the plate. So to get back to that bottom of the first, it was Maui Ahuna who singled with Taylor on, and then with runners at first and second, Andrew Pinckney, the center fielder, hitting cleanup and making his debut, hit into a fielder's choice. And the Commodores caught the Chatham defense sleeping. As that fastball stays upstairs to even the count at two and two. It was Pinckney who reached. Ahuna was outgoing for second, but Taylor rounded third and came all the way home as no one covered the plate to make it one to nothing. Jacob Walsh then singled Pinckney in for the second run. And that breaking ball, again elevated for hit, and the count runs full on Dominic Tamez, the number six hitter and catching today for Chatham. He's been flirting around with that breaking ball, especially with right-handed batters up. So he's got another full count here that he's going to have to win. 3-2. Just misses the outside corner, and Tamez is aboard. Face first base runner of the day, allowed by hit, and it's a two-out bases on balls here in the top of the second to bring up Cooper Engel, the designated hitter hitting seventh for Chatham. Top of the first inning around the Chatham order, Nate Nainkill led off, grounded to short. Marcus Brown, the shortstop, hitting second, struck out looking before Chuck Ingram, the left fielder, hitting third, struck out swinging to end the inning. Noah Ledford struck out swinging, the first baseman hitting cleanup for Chatham to lead things off in this inning. As the first pitch to Ingle is up from hit, and it's 1-0. Adonis Herrera, the third baseman, hitting fifth, flew out to center. Dominic Tamez, the catcher, hitting sixth, just walked. Cooper Ingle DHing at the plate, hitting seventh. Caden Grice, the center fielder on deck, hitting eighth. As that bender is in for a strike, and it's one and one. And rounding out the Chatham order, second baseman Thomas Caulfield hitting ninth. 
Now that we've got you up to speed, <laughs> we can finally focus on what's going on right now as Hit delivers the 1-1 and it's down low. Cooper Ingo coming off a very nice season at Clemson where he hit 353, struck out only 28 times. But a slow start for him as he enters today hitting 182. Two hits, two walks, and two strikeouts. Well, it's been a slow start around the league for mm -hmm. a lot of Cape Cod hitters, especially on this Falmouth team. You wouldn't know it if you had just tuned in today for the first time. Breaking ball catches the outside corner, and it's two and two from hit. He likes making them close. Hasn't been a, a demanding or a one-way count. Well, hit ran a full count on every hitter in the first inning, and he did it to Tamez before walking him. Now the 2-2 two -two to Ingle, and he does just that again. Three and two. It is almost like he heard you. You're always afraid they can, right? Yeah. But he, <laughs> but all the way up but here. he shows the ability that he can do it. He's done it, did it twice in the first inning. He's just going to have to do it again and not do what he did to Tamez. Payoff pitch. Tamez goes, but it's fouled off the plate. Tamez certainly not a running threat. Still only one base and five tries down at Alabama this spring. And that's just the beauty of or the rule of baseball, the unwritten one, where it's a full count and two outs. Runners are going no matter what if they're at first. They'll try the payoff again. Engel standing in. Tamez goes with two down, and it's ball four. DeCunto goes to retrieve it, but it's the second walk in as many hitters for Grayson Hit, who has worked himself into a jam with two down here in the top of the second. Well, the Anglers have drawn a couple of walks in recent days. We mentioned Engel had come into today drawing two. So now he's going to face a Caden Grice, who has three hits on the year, one walk, but he has struck out five times. So he's going to attack this center fielder right here. Grice, a left-handed hitter, second of three in the bottom third of this Chatham order. Hits delivery. On the outside corner, a little bit elevated, and it's 0-1. 90 on the gun from the Commodore Southpaw, making his summer debut. Hit standing at 6'3", 195. His 0-1. Low and away, and it's 1-1. One one. Well, when one Tiger steps out, another one steps in. Bryce just finishing his sophomore season at Clemson. Hit 247. 12 home runs. Struck out 94 times in 219 plate appearances. 1-1 one, one up high to Grice, and the stat you mentioned when he came up to the plate with the five strikeouts already this summer, he's brought that over from his ACC play in the spring. Mm -hmm. He had a good season, 813 OPS, so he can swing the bat, but he led the ACC in strikeouts. Up near 100, and the 2-1. Breaking ball this time low, and it's 3-1. and one, So hit struggling to find the zone these last couple hitters and at risk of loading the bases with two down. Well, what happens with big hitters that do big things? They strike out a lot, and especially Grice being a home run hitter this year. 3-1. Low and away, not close, and Grice heads on to first. The third consecutive walk for Grace and Hit. And the bases are loaded with two down and Thomas Caulfield coming to the plate. Well, you always hear about you, hits you can manage via base runners, but if you walk runners on, and especially the bases loaded, that's just a recipe for disaster. Luckily, they have Thomas Caulfield up, who is off to a slow start as well. But nevertheless, all these hitters can do big things with the bases loaded. Commodore's on top two to nothing, though, as they got some first inning insurance right out of the gates but that's the beauty about baseball is that no lead is safe Thomas Caulfield a left-handed batter who comes into this game one for his first 11 for the anglers this summer now hits with the bases loaded and two down Caulfield could drive in his first RBI with a base hit first delivery to him is low and away and all of a sudden hit missing to his glove side on the delivery. He's yanked a couple pitches down 
in that direction, particularly to these last few left-handed hitters. Breaking ball lined into right center field over the head of Mooney. Here comes Tomez to score. Ingle right behind him, and it's a two-run game-tying single off the bat of Thomas Caulfield. Little hanger off the end of the bat. Found the grass that uh, the Commodores did not want the ball to find. They wanted that ground ball or anything in the infield to retire him. Breaking ball lined into right center field over the head of Breaking ball hit lightly on the ground to second base. Mooney picks it and a good pick sends us to the ball. but he puts the tag on to complete the strikeout. And there's one away here in the bottom of the second inning. Second straight K in the books for right-hander Hayden Dirk. And don't let him get comfortable after having a shaky start back in the first. As you mentioned, heading into this inning, now he's got back-to-back -back Ks. First pitch breaking ball into Drew Brutcher, and it's 0-1, 81 on the gun. From Hayden Dirk, the right-hander, stands at 6'3", 195 from Pompano Beach, Florida. Second straight breaker is down in the dirt, and it's 1-1. One one. 
It was Dirk who in the bottom of the first inning allowed two runs on three hits as Butcher cuts through that offering and it's two and one or one and two rather. Commodore's left one. That one two barely missed on the outside corner. And the count even to Brutcher, two and two. Another Commodore looking for his first hit. 2-2, two, two, check swing. They appeal to third, and Tim Reiner, the third base umpire, gives Brutcher a new lease on life in this at bat. Chatham dugout letting home plate umpire Jeff Merzel hear it on those last two pitches. 3-2, swing oh. and a line drive right back to the mound. It hits Dirk. Brutcher makes his way to first, and they're going to have to see if Dirk is all right. Oh, man. First hit of this. His first hit. 2-2, two, two, check swing. They appeal to third, and Tim Reiner, the third base. Real bad. And all likelihood he's going to get his warm up pitches in this inning. Yeah, and they're signaling down to the bullpen as well. Try and get somebody loose. A terrible break for Dirk here if he can't continue. And I hear Chatham's frustration. Little, little uh, borderline pitches that could have gotten him out of that at bat. And he's struck on a comebacker, but. That's just one of those tough breaks. Hopefully he's all right. And in any event, if he continues this inning, he's got to deal with Butcher over at first base. It looks like we've got someone for Chatham jogging into this game. And that's it for Hayden Dirk. He leaves. Hopefully to get examined, and hopefully he's all right. But a new hurdler into the game for the Anglers. An inning in the third in the books for Dirk if his day is officially done, and it looks to be. Tommy Molsky, the right-hander, now takes to the mound, and he'll get as much time as he needs to warm up because of the injury. So officially an inning and a third for Dirk. So far, two runs on four hits. And if Butcher comes around to score in this inning, it would be the third and final run charged against him. But certainly would have liked to have seen more from Dirk, the right-hander from UL Lafayette. Unfortunate break means that the Anglers are going to have to get creative today with their pitching staff. Fortunately, they did have the day off yesterday, so you figure they've got some rest out in the pen, more so if they had played a game yesterday. And the thing is with the rest, as we, we talked about it when we were in Harwich on Tuesday, we haven't seen too many pitchers go far in games just yet at the beginning stages of the Cape Cod season. So they more or less probably prepared for it, but no means were they ready for Hayden Dirk to leave after one and a third. So Hayden Dirks, Cape debut this summer, comes to an unceremonious end. He's struck by a comebacker with a one out in the bottom of the second. And he gives way to Tommy Molsky, making his debut as well this summer. Right-hander from Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. Did his throwing this spring for Penn State. 16 games and 12 starts, so he's not completely four into the bullpen. But he's got to get loose basically from scratch here. No indication that Chatham was going to pull Dirk anytime soon, and now they've got to get someone in the game. A stat that's something to take note of from Molsky at Penn State, after, out of 251 batters that he faced, he had only given up four home runs. So, I mean, talk about the ERA and the record. It's a little bit up there, not necessarily the best you want to see, but the four home runs in 251 batters, that's, that's very impressive. For manager Tom Holliday on the Chatham dugout, 
All he wants to see right now from Molsky is some quality innings. He's got to get him from someone today with still a lot of baseball yet to be played. And if we were to think about that stat with Molsky not allowing the home runs, you said it, didn't allow a lot of balls to fly out of the yard over at Penn State. But what that suggests is that his fastball has decent movement, maybe a little bit of sink to it. Batters end up hitting it on the ground. From what we were able to get from Twitter and <laughs> any scouting services from Molsky, he's got a fastball in the mid-90s. Also throws a slider and a changeup. We've seen him go through his progression, and the radar gun's been tracking him so far as he warms up. He's been up uh, around 90 miles an hour with the heater. And something that's tough for him is on the 51 runs that he gave up this year, 39 of them were earned. So he gave up 12 unearned runs. That is something as a pitcher where you just shake your head and say, darn, but move on and the mindset as a pitcher always is just attack the next batter, no matter how they score, no matter how they reach. Well, now he has to focus up with Brutcher over at first base and Angelo DeCunto, the number nine hitter, standing in. First pitch to him is spiked in the left-handed batter's box, and it's 1-0. and That would be, they did rule that a single from Brutcher, so it's the first one of the season for the right-hander, right-handed batter. Maybe the cruelest scoring ruling yeah. in all of baseball. Brutcher takes off for second, the throw down, not in time. Tamez could not gun down Brutcher on his way to second, and it's a stolen base for the Commodore right fielder. Well, he has gunned down one man today already. Brutcher didn't get the best jump, but the throw was a little bit of the right side of the bag and lucky to have it close for the Anglers' defense. Molsky's 1-1 one, one comes way inside and nearly gets a piece of DeCunto, and it's 2-1. and one. DeCunto's lone hit this year was a double. 2-1. Swing and a miss. Molsky took a little off, even to the count at 2-2. Two and two. And if there's anything to be believed about players getting more comfortable when they get back to their natural defensive position, we've heard Anthony McKenzie talk about that earlier in the year, how he prefers to play in the field than DH. Maybe DeCunto more comfortable today getting back behind the plate. 3-2 in the dirt, but Brutcher does not advance. It's one of those where you get a big secondary lead and you think about it, you just stop and you're like, Maybe I can't get there. And you, you had that one second, and then you just retrieve back to the bag. So a full count for the Chatham staff. Molsky's 3-2 is bounced on the ground to second base. Caulfield makes the flip, and there's the second out of the inning. Brutcher heads on to third. And there's one on third with two down here in the bottom of the second. Well, now all Mooney has to do is what his counterpart for the Chatham Anglers lineup did, Thomas Caulfield, and just find the outfield and deliver a run. Productive out for the Commodores. Takunto advances the runner for one of the hotter hitters in this Falmouth squad. Mooney takes strike one. Fastball on the outer half. So 0-1 on Mooney, who singled to lead off the game again today. He did that against Katuit back on Monday was caught stealing later in the bottom of the first. 0-1, check swing, no appeal, and it's 1-1. One one. He did a very good job pulling that one back. He's been very selective in the batter's box all season long, knowing what pitches to take and what not to. 1-1 one one is low again, and it's 2-1. and one. Mooney with five hits in his first 13 at bats this season. He's been one of the lone Commodores who has been swinging the bat well since day one. Molsky's 2-1. Breaking ball doesn't break enough. Stays high, and it's 3-1. and one. Up until that game on Harwich, th through the first two games, Mooney had the lone extra base hits. Two doubles to his credit as the 3-1 bounces in the dirt. And the Commodore's second baseman heads for first on a two-out walk. 
Runners at first and third and two down here in the bottom of the second. And it's been a heavy traffic kind of evening so far on the base paths for both teams in a 2-2 game. Two down. And Molsky trying to work out of this jam. Rutcher at third would not be charged to him. He was put on base by Hayden Dirk, who had to leave the game after being struck by a comebacker. And Braden Taylor now digs into the batter's box for his second at bat of the season. Second plate appearance, I should say, because he walked back in the first, later scored. Commodores welcoming back a guy who was selected to the All-Star team last summer. And he bats lefty against the righty Molsky as that ball comes down and in. Count 1-0 and oh on Taylor. Had two home runs last year with the Commodores. He was a doubles guy. Played for the Commodores in 26 contests last year. And the 1-0 to him. Softly hit over the third baseman Herrera's head. Brutcher comes in to score. Mooney gets to second, and it's a two-out RBI single for Braden Taylor. Welcome back to Gov Fuller Field. And it Bolski as that ball comes down and in. The 1-0 to him. Softly hit over the third baseman Herrera's head. Brutcher comes in to score. 1-0 to him. Softly hit over the... The 1-0 to him. The 1-0 to him. Softly hit over... The 1-0 to him. Softly hit over the third baseman Herrera's head. Brutcher comes in to score. Well, as they showed on the replay there, it wasn't necess necessarily on the end of the bat. It was on the more outer parts of the bat, the perfect point of the wooden bat to drive it the other way. The 2 on the outside corner, strike three called. And Ahuna down on strikes again, but not before the Commodores get another run in the bottom of the second inning on the Braden Taylor RBI single. It's three to two Commodores as we head to the top of the third. Hey, Commodores fans, sharpen your baseball skills with some of America's finest players from the best college programs in the country. Clinic attendees will have opportunities to work on hitting, base running, infield and outfield play, as well as pitching and catching. Attendees will also participate in Commodores Chat, where coaches and players discuss topics like sportsmanship, academics, teamwork, and other issues important to being an all-around player. Clinics are offered Tuesday, June 21st through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Three separate clinics will be offered for ages 5 to 14. Welcome back to Gulf Fuller Field as we head to the top of the third inning between the Commodores and the Chatham Anglers. It's been a high-scoring afternoon, at least so far, as Grayson hit the left-hander deals 
to Chuck Ingram, the left fielder, and it's 2-0. and oh. Well, this is a little bit of a different game than we've seen all season so far. Delivery to Ingram, this time catches the corner. Commodore scoring three runs offensively today, coming into today. They had only scored three runs through the first three games. Two on opening day, shut out on Monday against Katuid and had one run in Harwich on Tuesday night. So a good start here for the Doors. Chuck Ingram, the left fielder, looks at strike two from Grayson Hitt. Ingram thought he had drawn ball four. Chucked his bat towards the Chatham dugout, but now he has to go pick it up. If this pitch is even remotely close and he takes it, the call's going to hit. Umpires don't like that. You think Jeffrey Merzel would do that to him? I will, we're about to find out if he elects to take it here. But usually you see that around baseball. The 3 2. Breaking ball, fouled away right side. Not one to think that umpires are naturally spiteful people. Oh, not at all. That's just that's just one of those unlucky like coincidences that you see in baseball. The 3 2. Fastball up high, and this time Ingram gets his walk. It's a leadoff free pass here in the top of the third inning. Well, nevertheless, that's a fantastic at bat by Chuck Ingram. And I mean, we talked about it back in the second inning. Walks are a recipe for disaster. There wasn't a leadoff walk last inning. It was a strikeout and a flyout, but this inning's a little bit different as Ledford steps in. Noah Ledford, the switch hitter, batting right-handed against the lefty hit. Takes a breaking ball, and it's 0-1. And, and hit, who had to sit in the second inning as the Commodores did some hitting against two different Chatham pitchers, looks to have found that feel for the breaking ball again. He lost his control back in the second, but has been throwing it for strikes here as Ledford lifts this one to center. Pinckney heading over to his right a couple steps to make the catch, and there's out number one. I was about to say Factor's got it, but I'm like, wait a minute. He's in left field today. No, but a good job there. Like you mentioned, he's had a good feel for the breaking ball these past couple of at-bats, especially tossing it to right-handed batters, which is so rare when you see a lefty on righty toss an off-speed pitch, whether it be a slider or a curveball, and they actually have a good feel for it. But hit has been working it right now, and now he's looking for that ground ball double play to get out of the inning. Adonis Herrera, the third baseman, steps in. He's 0 for 1 today. And another breaker, this one in for a strike as well. So hit all of a sudden has found his touch for that pitch. And it's the curveball working for the Germantown, Tennessee native so far in this game. Fastball, curveball pitcher primarily. Fastball 91 to 93 and a high 70s breaking ball. This time the breaker is lined to third. Caught by Taylor, the throw back to Walsh, skips off his glove and trails over into shallow right and Walsh can't pick it up. Ingram goes over to second as the Commodore defense throws it around once again. Well, that was a weird one, but think about if the first baseman Walsh did not make that stop. That's maybe two bases right there. Fort unfortunate break for the Commodores as the Anglers base runner Ingram was able to advance regardless. But now he got two outs though, so now he just got to focus on attacking the catcher Dominic Thomas. And it's an E5 or an E3, whichever. E5 because Taylor made the throw. So an unlucky break as Walsh struggled to pick up that throw. And it's 0-1 now on Dominic Tamez. Tamez walked back in the second inning. Hit looking to attack and get him behind early. The 0-1. In for a strike. Pumping it in on his Alabama Crimson Tide teammate. Levi Wells warming up in the bullpen for the Commodores, it looks like. Hits 0-2 pitch. Breaking ball bounces away from DeCunto and on to third goes Ingram. Wild pitch, uncorked by hit. And the runner suddenly for Chatham stands at third base. Well, now he's got to be careful. Anything hanging, if he throws that breaking ball and it hangs on the outside part of the plate, 
Look for Tamez to just loop it into left center to left field. Tamez, who took a long journey to get to Alabama, first played at Arkansas, then McLennan Community College. 1-2, swing and a miss. He cannot drive in a run off his Crimson Tide teammate. And down go the Anglers in the top of the third inning. They leave one as we head to the bottom of the third. And the Commodores lead it 3-2. to two. Want to house a Falmouth Commodore? Be sure to sign up to become a host family today. Hosting a Cape League player can be very rewarding. Players connect and bond with the families, often forming lifelong relationships. Please remember that every Commodores player is bound and governed by NCAA rules and regulations. In order to maintain their collegiate athletic ability, host families receive a weekly allowance from the Falmouth Commodores to help cover player expenses. Host families are not required to provide transportation to players. The Falmouth Commodores are very grateful to the wonderful families that host our players each and every year. If you are interested in hosting a Falmouth Commodores player for the summer, contact our housing coordinator, Lisa Smuda, at lisatz143 at comcast.net. For more information, visit our website at falmouthcommodores.com. Thank you for supporting our players and roll doors. Welcome back to Go Fuller Field as we head to the bottom of the third inning between the Falmouth Commodores and Chatham Anglers. The doors read it three to two. And just a reminder before we get back to the action, as a proud sponsor of the Cape Cod Baseball League, the Mass State Lottery is celebrating the games we love playing. From the baseball diamond to the many lottery games that help support all 351 cities and towns across the Commonwealth. So here's to 50 years of winning and 50 more. The Commodores have been winning the battles at the plate so far in this game. Three runs on five hits through two, which seemed just about unimaginable about 48 hours ago <laughs> when they put up three runs in as many games to start out the season. And the Doors looking for their first win today at 0-3. And hitting better will go a long way in accomplishing that feat. Andrew Pinckney, the cleanup hitter and center fielder today, now steps in. First offering to him from Molsky trails low, and it's 1-0. That third run of the Falmouth offense was charged to the starter, Hayden Dirk, so officially three runs allowed for the starter for the A's. This one ripped down the left field line, foul. And that one's just going to keep on bouncing all the way to Orleans with how hard it was hit. <laughs> and definitely had the exit velo on that one. Another member of the University of Alabama, Pinckney coming over, making his debut tonight for the Commodores. 1-1, one, one, foul tipped, and the count stays 1-2. and two. It was Pinckney who hit into that fielder's choice back in the first inning where he reached. Maui Ahuna was out at second, and Braden Taylor came around from second to score as the Anglers got disorganized on defense and didn't have anybody covering home plate. 1-2, two, two of Check swing, they appeal to first. Timothy Carey says he went, and Pinckney will take a seat, a victim of a strikeout here to lead off the bottom of the third inning. The first baseman from Oregon, number 33, Jacob Walsh. Now this kid, Jacob Walsh Carter, is an absolute beast, coming off a huge year in the Pac-12. 295 on the year, 18 doubles. First pitch to Walsh is down low in the count 1-0. and oh. And uh, Logan, ordinarily, for guys out on the West Coast, uh, uh, West Coast, I would just trust your judgment, someone who goes out to Cal Lutheran. But the numbers support that statement that you made. Walsh was tearing it up this spring with Oregon. That fastball tails up high, and it's 2-0. and oh. So Walsh in his freshman spring with Oregon started 55 games, hit 295. 2-0, wrap foul right side. And it was enough to lead the Ducks in doubles, set program records in that category, and for total bases with 103. Tied the freshman mark for home runs with six. So this guy's got power, he's got the contact skills, and he's got the big frame, the 2-1. Outside, it's 
in his class. He was ranked number four in the state of Nevada in overall baseball players by perfect game. So he's lived up to it. The 3-1 from Molsky is on the inside corner. Good fastball to make the count full. The Walsh, a lefty bat in the Commodore lineup against the righty, Molsky. Payoff pitch. Just outside for ball four. Nerves of steel from Walsh to take that pitch. Oh, absolutely. But he's rewarded for that. He takes first with a one-out walk here in the bottom of the third. And he hung, ar hung around in the box a little bit longer to see if that was going to be called strike three. But definitely missed outside a little bit. Good walk drawn by Walsh at Oregon this year. He only walked 23 times. He stands at first now with Cross Factor at the plate, who takes a fastball outside at 89 miles an hour from Molsky. And Factor, one of the Commodores today, trying to get it going, including his strikeout that ended the first inning. He's now one for 12 on the young summer. Moved down to sixth in the order. 1-0 again. Molsky trying that outside corner, and he's not being rewarded for it by home plate umpire Jeffrey Merzel. A little Pro bit too far out. Cross Factor hit third on opening day, and back in Harwich, he went to the two spot prior to moving down to the six spot. 2-0. He had a good rip at a fastball and fouled it right back. It's 2-1. Jacob Walsh over at first base. Not a big-time base stealer, but did swipe five bags and six tries at Oregon this spring. Molsky's 2-1 is ripped to right field. Nankill going back, and it is off the wall. Walsh lumbering for third. Factor speeding his way to second, and he's in there with a double. Well, we said it was a matter of time before these bats started to heat up. The sixth hit of the day for the Falmouth Commodores. Cross Factor has his first extra base hit on the season. And he's having himself a uh, better start than the any, any of the other games up until this point. And now it's going to be up to the DH, Kyle Russell. The Commodores showing both discipline and timing in this game. First pitch to Russell, breaking ball up high, and it's 1-0. Factor really put a hurt on that ball. First time we've seen him pull a ball with a lot of authority this season and nearly had himself the first Commodore home run of the summer as Russell flies that one foul right side onto the hill and it plunks in between a few picnickers, even the count at one and one. Well, we saw Brutcher get his first weird base hit of the season and it's his first one overall. Russell trying to do the same thing. 1-1, one, one, infield corners in and that 1-1 one, one strays inside and didn't clip Russell to count 2-1. and one. I don't think he wanted it to either. He wanted to stay in this box and attack and try and drive these runs in. 2-1. Right down the pipe, and it's 2-2. Two and two. Russell didn't like that. He thought that was a little too low right below the knees, but it's a good pitch there from Tommy Molsky, the Chatham A's pitcher. Ledford at first and Herrera at third tracing in. The 2-2 two, two is... Line to right field, Nankill again makes the catch. Walsh tags and heads home. The throw back in, close play, but Walsh slides in. And it's four to two Commodores here in the bottom of the third inning. Doesn't always have to be pretty. And especially when you're just trying to attack early in the game, because that's been the mindset thus far. Six total runs of offense between these two offensive clubs. Four to two Commodores. Russell does his job and drives in the fourth run of the day on the sacrifice fly. Drew Brutcher now stands back in. First pitch to him. Catches the corner, and it's 0-1. It was Brutcher who singled his last time up on that comebacker that hit Hayden Dirk, the Chatham starter. 0-1, lined into center field. That'll play to run. Factor comes in to score, and Brutcher has himself a two-for-two two day. It's 5-2 to two Commodores here in the bottom of the third inning. Well, he found a spot on the outfield that nobody was. And that's all it takes when you have a runner 90 feet away over at third base. So now he's got to keep the train rolling with DeCanto up in the box now. 
And Factor with good speed. He stole, or rather, Brutcher with good speed. With Picunto at the plate, who takes a slider outside, and it's 0-1. Good spot there from Molsky. Brutcher with the speed to play center in right field today. He stands at first. And the 0-1. Breaking ball started inside, but couldn't find the plate, and it's 1-1. One and one. Tecunto had that double late Tuesday night to break that streak. 1-1 one, one well inside, forcing Tecunto back. He's had to dodge a couple mm -hmm. close inside pitches in this game. With a man at first and two down, Brutcher stands over there now following his line drive single to center that played it a run. Time called, and Molsky throws up a little floater. Decunto readjusts, and we'll try it again as some frightening-looking clouds now come in overhead over Gov Fuller Field, coming in from left. Decunto fouls that offering back, and it's 2-2. Two and two. Well, We saw something like that happen on opening day against Harwich, where time was granted during a pitch delivery. Like we mentioned before, obviously no malice with any umpire. That's just one of those tough circumstances in baseball. At that point, you just airmail it to the backstop. 2-2, Two -two, Brutcher goes. DeCunto swings and misses, and the inning is over. But not before. The Commodores get two more runs on two hits, and they leave a man. We head to the top of the fourth in a 5-2 to two game. favorite song my favorite song proud to be an american and i'm proud to be an american where at least i know i'm free what's your favorite breakfast food oh my my favorite breakfast <laughs> um, on the west coast i don't know if it's a thing back back east but um spam <laughs> wheels or doors um I think wheels, honestly, because you use wheels like more than I feel like you would use doors because if you're moving things around, more than likely it's on a wheel. Welcome back to Gov Fuller Field. And if you tuned in late or if you made it out to this game, you've been in for a treat. The Commodores lead it five to two as we head to the top of the fourth inning against the Chatham Anglers. So for the Commodores who came into this game hitting just 149 as a team, they have exploded, at least by their standards, in the early going of this one with seven hits through the first three frames. And now a new pitcher on the mound for the Doors looks to keep Chatham at bay to hold that lead. It's number 13, Levi Wells, the right-hander. So he takes his warm-up pitches. We're leaving Grayson Hitt, who went three innings in this game. Allowed one hit, two earned, four walks, four strikeouts. Wells, the right-hander, a returner from last summer with the Commodores, pitched in 10 games in 2021 with the Doors. 17 innings, a 3-7-1 ERA. He was definitely effective, and now he's back for more. Struck out 29 last summer and touched 95 with the fastball the last time he pitched at the Gov. You figure he's only added possible velo since then, so another live arm coming over from Texas State. Yeah, the sub-3 ERA, the 2.98 ERA this past season at Texas State. 8-2 and two record, 86 punchies, and he did give up the 11 home runs, but... He was able to hold opponents to a sub-230 batting average. So it's a pleasure to have Levi back this summer and making his 2022 season debut, as you mentioned, partner. So Grayson Hitt, who started this game, gave some good, had some bad, lost his control a bit in the second inning when he walked four, but was able to get through three innings of two-run balls, struck out four. And 
Now Wells deals with Cooper Engel, the DH, who takes strike one. Wells was named to the All Sun Belt Conference first team in the 2022 season. 0 oh, 1 breaking ball snaps in there, and it's 0 oh 2 very quickly on Engel, who walked his first time up, later scored. Looking to get something going for Chatham here in the top of the fourth with the Anglers down three. Swing and a miss. Wells dispatches Ingle with relative ease. Three pitches and a swinging strikeout for out number one here in the top of the fourth. Well, excuse me, that's how you do it coming out of the bullpen. Now batting the center fielder from Clemson, number and Caden Grice, the center fielder, Digs into the left-handed batter's box. He walked his first time up as well. Wells rocks back and forth and deals. Outside, and it's 1-0. and Bye-bye, oh, immaculate inning. <laughs> <laughs> Wells ready, now the 1-0. Breaking ball and a good one. Snapped off into the zone, and it's 1-1. One and one. Well, this is the kind of batter Levi Wells should feast on with Grice. The strikeout machine this year. And at Clemson. 1-1. One, one, tap to second base. Mooney completes the easy play for out number two. Now batting the second field, second from so the Commodores, who came in today not just struggling on offense, but also struggling... In the pitching department and on defense, they ranked last in the Cape League in scoring, last in runs allowed, and they had made the most errors in the league. So they have the unholy trifecta coming into today, but with hit solid start and Wells looking live so far in this relief appearance. Figure with the day of rest and a couple new faces, the Commodores can turn the page past a pretty brutal start. 1-0. Breaking ball again. Wells getting that bender over for a strike when he wants. That one at 80 miles an hour. And not much Caulfield could do with it. Batting lefty against the righty Wells. One and one, two down, base is empty. Fastball, this one tails in high. And it's two and one on Caulfield, who played in the Coastal Plain League last summer with the high point of Thomasville High Toms, and I actually got to see quite a bit of him last summer. This guy is a really talented hitter as he lines this pitch into center field, and he's got himself a two-for-two two day. Pinckney struggles to pick it up, but now he throws back in, and Caulfield on with his second single of the evening. And the top of the Chatham order now coming back around with Nate Nankill. So now when it comes to... Nane kill. He was trying to extend the inning. Caulfield, as you mentioned, having a very good day out of the nine spot. He struggled coming into today, so it's got to feel good for him. Strike called on the outside corner to Nane kill. I want to go back on the thing you talked about, about the errors with Falmouth. Only one today, but that error was a completely harmless one. That's one of those where it was one of the unusual, untraditional ones. That pitch through the wickets of DeCunto and heading on to second, Caulfield. He gets in there easily. And a man at second now with two down in the top of the fourth. And a 2-0 count on Nankill. So Wells, who came into this inning firing strikes, now falling behind the Chatham leadoff hitter with some of their thunder on deck and in the hole. Well, now, now's a perfect time to thank the, uh, the Falmouth Commodores for uh, upgrading the field is that Ball, thanks to the backstop, went all the way back to Wells <laughs> on the ricochet. 1-1. One, one. Breaking ball again, catching the zone, and that's a, been a quality pitch in this inning for Wells. We talked about it with hit. Wells using it, but now he's got the righty-on-righty -righty matchup. He's done a good job moving it from the inside part back to the strike zone. Nankill trying to extend the inning down 1-2. and two. Wells steps off. Caulfield trots his way back to second base. And Commodore hitting coach Ryan Eiley said something after the Katuit game. He commented that the team had to do more with pitches that were in the zone to be hit rather than take them. 1-2 to Nankill. 
We'll hold that thought as he strikes out to end the top of the fourth. Levi Wells comes in, strikes out two, and keeps the Anglers at bay. As we head to the bottom of the fourth inning, the Commodores lead it 5-2. to two. Hey, Commodore fans. Do you want to have your name placed in the Falmouth Commodore history? Arnie Allen Diamond at Gulf Fuller Field has a spot for you. For the first time since before the pandemic began, you have the ability to purchase a brick with your name on it and have it placed right on the walkway that leads to the merchandise booth located directly behind home plate. To find out more about how you can purchase a brick, visit FalmouthCommodores.com slash buy a brick program or scan the QR code that you see on your screen today. Welcome back to Gov Fuller Field. There have been three home games for the Commodores this season. All three have been started by a pitcher from Alabama. Is it a coincidence? No, not in the slightest. But when talking to Grayson Hitt, tonight's starting pitcher earlier today, he says this opportunity means the world for him. A chance for him to show what he does best on Cape Cod. And if he's successful, along with his teammate Ben Hess, it can lead to multiple benefits for them, their, their careers at Alabama, and also their professional career. We all know about Alabama football, but for Grayson, it's an opportunity for him to shed light on the diamond in Tuscaloosa. Guys, back up to you in the booth. If you were to be asked about it, with Falmouth starting a couple different Crimson Tide pitchers, three in their first four games, first Antoine Jean, then Ben Hess, and now Grayson hit today. But some teams have good relationships with certain programs. You end up with a lot of guys from certain places. Grayson Hitt, grateful to pitch today, and Commodore fans grateful for his effort. He kept the team in the game during what was a shaky start all around, not only on the field, but on the technical side over here at the Gov. We finally got the beast up and running, that being our broadcast booth, and we're happy to be with you this evening. Alex Mooney. Falmouth leadoff hitter takes ball one from a new Chatham pitcher, right-hander Nicholas Regalado. Here in the bottom of the fourth and the 1-0. Struck into center field. Grice go heading back and makes the catch for out number one. Again, good wood put on the ball by Mooney, but couldn't get enough. And there's one away in the bottom of the fourth. Well, Regalado transferred from Miami to Florida Southwestern. Sophomore just completed his season. 15 appearances, three starts, 2-0. Also had a save on a 3-8-6 ERA with 48 punchies. Working quickly here in this bottom of the fourth. He's staring down Braden Taylor, waiting for him to get back in the box. Taylor swings at that offering and misses. It's 1-1. One and one. Regalado with a fastball 91 to 95, topped out at 96 and a sweeping slider as it's been described, high 70s, low 80s. Misses with that offering low and away and it's two and one on the left-handed hitting Taylor. It was one for one today, drove in a, a run with a single in the second, walked in the first. Two one skips in front of the plate. Tamez couldn't corral it on its first hop. And it's 3-1 and one on the Commodore third baseman. Three, one outside. And Taylor takes first, his second walk of the game. He's been on base all three times he's been up. Well, Braden Taylor this past year at TCU drew 53 walks. So a very disciplined hitter up there. Maui Ahuna takes a fastball head high, and it's 1-0. So Taylor was getting on a lot with those walks, Logan, as you said, and he also stole 10 bases in as many tries. They never caught him on the base pads. 1-0 outside, and it's 2-0, and now in a hitter's count with only one away. We've seen Coach Trundy send runners quite a bit the first few games. He hasn't always rolled the dice to great effect. We've seen some guys get caught stealing, but you figure he might send Taylor here. Doesn't go on 2-0. And Regalado fires in a strike. It's two and one on Ahuna. One for two today, a single and a strikeout. Two one. 
Skips in the dirt. It gets away from Tamez, and on to second goes Taylor. Ironically, right before that pitch, you mentioned the one and two. The Falmouth Commodores one for two on the bases today as well. And now Taylor's in scoring position. Mooney was caught on the base paths. Brutcher stole second back in the second. But now it doesn't matter as the Doors have a runner in scoring position. Taylor at second and Ahuna at the plate. Battery mates Regalado and Tamez talking things over on the mound. And for good reason, there's a really talented hitter standing at home plate right now in Maui Ahuna hitting in the three hole for the Doors both back on Tuesday and today for a good reason. This guy can absolutely rake. Now the 3-1. Fouled off left side, and it's 3-2. and two. So Ahuna, who made his debut on Tuesday, wasn't exactly what he had in mind with four Ks and a fifth today, but you figure he's going to start swinging the lumber well here pretty soon. Payoff pitch to him. Down low and away. Good take by Ahuna. And now runners at first and second with one away here in the bottom of the fourth. Second straight walk for Regalado. Well, we saw this happen with Grayson Hit back in the second inning. A lot of consecutive walks. And it hurt the Falmouth pitcher. So they're trying to flip the script right here with Pinckney up to bat. Taylor in second. Ahuna at first. And Regalado trying to find that strike zone again. First pitch to Pinckney, low and away with a breaking ball, and there's that slider that we talked about when Regalado came into this inning. Pinckney, the right-handed hitter, is going to have to lay off that pitch. Now the 1-0. And he couldn't do it this time. Ugly swing and a miss, and it's 1-1. One and one. <laughs> You can see Pinckney kind of laughing to himself at the plate. He knows how nasty that one was. And the thing is, he's not panicking entirely because he was ahead in the count 1-0. So he can toy around just a little bit, but he definitely got fooled there. He could afford to take a rip, and now he gets ready for the 1-1. Runners at first and second, one out here in the bottom of the fourth. He swings over the top of that one, and it's 1-2. One and two. That was a filthy pitch on the inside part of the plate. Regalado. 3.86 ERA this spring down at Florida Southwestern State over in Fort Myers. 1-2. Breaking ball again, same spot, and Pinckney thought about it, but couldn't quite get his muscles to complete that swing. He holds off, and it's 2-2. Two and two. He was either going to that tailing away pitch or going to the pitch inside. So he was 1-2 and two to see if he goes inside again on a fastball. 2-2 instead, a breaking ball and a beauty to catch Pinckney looking. Absolutely broke one off on him. And nothing the Commodore center fielder could do with that. It's the first strike out of the game for Regalado, and there's two away here in the bottom of the fourth. Well, he fooled all of us. Had yet to throw that pitch that was a thing of beauty, and he absolutely buckled Pinckney for his second strikeout as a batter. Two strikeouts today at the plate for Pinckney. And Jacob Walsh, the first baseman, hits with two away. Breaking ball tails low and inside. So now Regalado has to deal with another lefty hitter. The two outs in this innings, Mooney and Pinckney, both right-handed batters. Taylor and Ahuna, both lefties, have walked. 1-0. Swing and a miss by Walsh. Even to the count at 1-1. One one. Well, Walsh has yet to be retired today. Run scoring single in the first and the walk back in the third. One one. Breaking ball and this one bends across the plate, but a little low, and it's two and one. Walsh who joined the team today. Looking to make a big impact here. He does have a a runner in scoring position. See what Ahuna does at first on the base race. Two on, two out. Regalado's delivery catches the inside corner, and it's two and two. Two balls, two strikes, two down, two on for Jacob Walsh, who's one for one today with a walk. Regalado deals, and Walsh fouls it right back. He was on that offering. 
and the count stays at two and two. Well, you saw a lot of full counts and even counts early for Chatham. Falmouth started doing the same thing, and they're trying to work it here. Regalado's 2-2, breaking ball low. Both runners take off. Tamez's throw to third is not in time. Taylor to third, Ahuna to second on another wild pitch. Oh, and that was aggressive. Taylor looked in to the catcher about three-quarters of the way through, and he kicked it into second gear. Is he really just decided to get underneath there and... You know, he realized that, hey, I got to go as, as fast as I can to have a chance at this because he might have gotten thrown out as he got under the tag. Aggressive certainly the right word because Tamez's throw was just barely behind the slide of Taylor. It was an awfully close play at third, but I guess now we see why the Commodore fans were so excited about Taylor coming over from TCU. He's made his debut today, and he's made his presence felt. 3-2 pitch low to Walsh. Breaking ball just misses again for Regalado, and another left-handed hitter reaches base against him. Base is loaded now with two down for Cross Factor, who most notably bats left-handed. Well, he had that double back in the third. Looking to do something here. First pitch to him is chopped right side. Ledford makes the throw to Regalado covering, and that's the inning. And the Commodores threaten, but they do not score in the bottom of the fourth. They leave the bases loaded as we head to the top of the fifth in a 5-2 to two game. Want to house a Falmouth Commodore? Be sure to sign up to become a host family today. Hosting a Cape League player can be very rewarding. Players connect and bond with the families, often forming lifelong relationships. Please remember that every Commodores player is bound and governed by NCAA rules and regulations. In order to maintain their collegiate athletic ability, host families receive a weekly allowance from the Falmouth Commodores to help cover player expenses. Host families are not required to provide transportation to players. The Falmouth Commodores are very grateful to the wonderful families that host our players each and every year. If you are interested in hosting a Falmouth Commodores player for the summer, contact our housing coordinator, Lisa Smuda, at lisatz143 at comcast.net. For more information, visit our website at falmouthcommodores.com. Thank you for supporting our players and roll doors. Welcome back to Gov Fuller Field. We are in the top of the fifth inning alongside Carter Bainbridge, tonight's lead play-by-play -play broadcaster, and Trey Redfield, our field reporter, Logan Sofranco, doing two innings for you on the play-by-play. -play. And what an important message that is about the PSA that includes the housing families and the host families. The memories that you can make with a player are absolutely amazing. The one that stands out recently is when Logan Gilbert, for the Mariners, pitched at Fenway Park just a couple of weeks back, if not a month ago, and his host family from Orleans actually went out and supported him. So you can create some real good relationships with, as they say, the stars of tomorrow tonight. Top of the fifth inning, the shortstop, Marcus Brown, will lead things off for the Chatham Anglers in a 5-2 ball game. First pitch he sees is cut on and missed. Marcus Brown struck out looking back in the first inning and grounded out to Alex Mooney back in the second inning. That ended a long inning for the right-hander Grayson Hit. That breaking ball is in there for strike number two. Or I beg your pardon, the left-hander. Both pitches working really well for mm -hmm. Levi Wells right now. The first pitch, a fastball that had good life on it, and he's been throwing that breaking ball. It's got a lot of bite. Two-strike pitch. Cut on and miss strike three. For the second straight inning, Levi Wells strikes out the first hitter he sees on three pitches. And when you have two pitches working like Wells does, that's what makes it difficult. If he only had the fastball and was only throwing it for strikes, these guys would adjust. But he's throwing that breaking ball for strikes, and he's doing it in fastball counts. 
That pitch misses outside as the left fielder Chuck Ingram steps up. 0 for 1 on the day, a strikeout and a walk. The junior from Wichita State on a 1-0 pitch. Misses that one, 1-1. One and, one. and to that point, it, it's much harder than it sounds to actually get to that point, even in a career or a game, where you have those two pitches working for you. Ideally, if you want to be a major league pitcher, you've got to have two quality pitches that you could throw for strikes on any given day. The 1-1 one, one is cut on and missed, and yeah, you're right, because when a pitch isn't working, you have to have, it's just in life, you have a backup, and if that backup is reliable, then that allows your arsenal to be a little more open, and you know, you have more pitches in it. On a two-strike pitch, Levi Wells gets some swinging. The second punchy of the inning for Levi Wells. And he's not just throwing the breaking ball for strikes. He threw it down in the zone, would have been balls in that at bat, but instead Ingram goes fishing for it both times, and that last one just fell off the table, like rolling a bowling ball off a desk. It just absolutely fell off, and nothing Ingram could do with it, but that's the advantage when you have the fastball working too. These hitters have to commit to one of them. Breaking ball gets in there for strike one to Noah Ledford, who struck out back in the second on an 0-1 pitch, takes ball one high. And there's been some, some strikeouts thus far. The Chatham Anglers have struck out eight total times on a 1-1 pitch. Ledford will take ball two. And then for the other end for the Falmouth offense, have struck out six times. On a 2-1 pitch, Ledford spoils that one foul. And we talked about it the other night at Harwich. 28 combined strikeouts between both offense. Falmouth struck out 17 times. Harwich struck out 11 times in a 4-1 Harwich win. Another two-strike pitch, Levi Wells misses downstairs, and the count is run full. There was something about the games on that Tuesday night. It wasn't just Falmouth that was struggling with the bats. I mean, Chatham tied with Hyannis 1-1 yeah. on that evening, and a lot of teams around the Cape came into today struggling. Half the teams in the league entering today hitting below 200 as a squad. Chatham not one of them at 204, but they're barely over. So it will not be three up and three down as Noah Ledford draws ball four. So now that's going to bring up the third baseman, Adonis Herrera. So Adonis Herrera flew out back in the second, and he lined out back in the third inning, and that was the lone error, which was charged to Braden Taylor. And the first pitch he sees catches the outside part of the strike zone for strike number one. So I don't know what it's been around the Cape so far. I mean, we've heard our video guy, Sean Oldred, talking about, what, a strawberry moon a couple nights ago, yeah. something like that, when the sky was really pretty. I don't know what was going on Tuesday, though. Well, we're starting to see the Falmouth bats come alive, and quite frankly, the Chatham bats as well. They had that lone two-run single back in the second inning, and that's their only scoring. One won the count. Two outs. Breaking ball is spoiled foul. A fan trying to make a catch, but he can't make it as it falls to the kid. And he's looking for the reaction. So another two-strike count that Levi Wells has worked as he's trying to finish off Herrera. Another two-strike pitch. Wells misses outside, two and two. And I think Chatham is struggling with the bats so far. Again, today they only have two hits. But there's some guys in this lineup who you know can swing it. It's just a matter of time before they do it. Specifically, Noah Ledford over at first base. And then Thomas Caulfield, who had the two-run single today. Those guys were teammates down in High Point Thomasville last year. Last summer, I should say. Nice take there from Herrera. And noted a player that... Well, we talked about a pregame, not here just yet, but Rock Reggio, absolutely electric performance in the regionals a couple weeks ago where he 
ran like Jack Sparrow and then sprinted around the bases in what felt like under 10 seconds. Count is all full for Herrera. Payoff pitch. Runner goes. Cut on and miss strike three. Levi Wells gets his fifth strikeout since coming out of the bullpen. We go to the bottom of the fifth. Still 5-2. to two. Now do your best cartwheel. I'm I'm not a gymnast. I'm barely I think I'd pull something if I did a cartwheel. Would you rather be able to fly or be invisible? I'm gonna go with fly, honestly. I think flying would be pretty cool. Be able to be up in the air around everybody, you know, fly with some birds, be pretty cool stuff, Carson. Hey Anders, now do your best and favorite dance move. <laughs> and the rockets red glare, bombs bursting in air. T-Mobile is proud to sponsor the Cape Cod Baseball League. T-Mobile is committed to serve those who serve, and that's why they go above and beyond for our act active duty military, veterans, and first responders. Visit your neighborhood T-Mobile store or T-Mobile.com to learn more. Back here at Gulf Fuller Field, a 5-2 ball game in the bottom of the fifth inning. And it's been a pretty good game and a little more enjoyable for the Falmouth faithful as we are approaching or if not at the halfway point of this game, Carter. Oh, after the first three games, you just knew that there was a lot of tension in that dugout. You score three runs in three games and you strike out 17 times in the third one. You just know that there's a team-wide funk going on. And that's just the game of baseball. It's pretty intangible. I think a day arrested these guys well, but there's also a lot of new faces of the Commodore lineup today. They've made seven signings since Tuesday couple releases so this team not only in the batting order but just roster wise looks a little different and the dice rolled by Jeff Trunney today have come up big. Walsh and Taylor today have RBIs. Taylor who was supposed to get here this weekend coming here a couple days early. We talked to our beat writer Tommy Mumo. He said Sunday was the arrival as that ball is cut on and missed but he is here and he delivered a pretty good base knock back in the second inning. And we talked about the new guys, Walsh contributing, but it's a feel-good game thus far with seven hits as that ball is right down Broadway for strike two. Kyle Russell, one of those guys you mentioned. Rock Reggio uh, for Chatham coming soon, like Jack Sparrow. I like to say uh, Kyle Russell is uh, Will Turner. Two-strike pitch. Cut on and miss, and it gets away from the catcher. Tamez, throw over to first, is in time. Kyle Russell is retired. So it's a out via way of the K, as that will be Regalado's second punch out. So Brutcher, who's actually had a very good day today, and it's, it's so weird saying cold through three games because, hey, let's be real, that's sometimes how long it takes for guys to get hot. But he is two for two on the day, and his second single back in the third scored a run. The first single, Carter, wasn't one that anyone is proud of. As that ball is right down Broadway, and we say not proud of because, of course, it's a tough situation when you hit a comebacker and it gets ruled a single. Breaking ball's in there, four strike two. Well, Regalado's done a good job in relief since he came in. Walked a couple in the last inning, but he's been sharp so far in this uh, this frame. And Brutcher, the ba the first base hit he had, of course, you know, it is unfortunate getting a single off a comebacker who hits someone. Could stop there by Tamez, but yeah, go, go ahead. At the same time, when you're going as poorly as Brutcher was through the first three games, he entered today 0 for 10. Sometimes it's just what it takes. I mean, you swing the bat, he, he knew he hit that ball hard, and confidence is a fickle thing. It could happen even if it wasn't quite as conventional as you wanted. Grounded foul. He mentioned the 0 for 10, 0 for 10 with five strikeouts. But the stud from Florida was recognized a lot during his freshman season. 
two strike pitch. Chopped up the middle. Brown makes the play over to first and Brutcher is retired. Two gone here in the bottom of the fifth inning. That was a little bit trickier of a play than Brown made it look. Yeah. Off the bat, it looked like it might be destined for center field, possible three hit day. Taken away by some rangy play from Marcus Brown. Moving over to his left and a good throw off balance for out number two in this inning. You're talking about a Carter with the ability to heat up as breaking ball misses low. And they've been doing a good job today and here we are in a 5-2 ball game. 1-0 pitch upstairs, 2-0. And, and specifically, we're talking about the ability for Regalado to get out of that jam back in the fourth. In the words of broadcaster Joe Davis, he got out of the jam that was created by him. 2-0. That's in there for strike one. Now, Regalado's breaking ball since he came in has probably been the better pitch for him than his fastball. Two and two now, and he is yet to yield a base runner via a base hit. And there you see it again. First time called for a strike on DeCunto. He knows he has to swing the bat. And Regalado just brings it a little lower, gets him to chase. That one is grounded right to Brown. And he makes the play. Still five to two as we go to the top of the sixth inning. Hey there, Commodore fans. Thanks for joining us and cheering on your Falmouth Commodores. Want to take a break from the action? Come make a visit to the merchandise booth. Check us out behind home plate. We have a bunch of new designs for you to purchase. From hats to shirts, jerseys, crewnecks, wine glasses, and even baby bibs. You think of it, we probably have it. From youth sizes to even adult double XLs. We have everything you need for family and friends. Be sure to come say hello and get a piece of Falmouth merch. Make a trip before we close up shop in the ninth inning. See you soon and roll doors. Back here at Gov Fuller Field in a 5-2 ball game. Hey, just a reminder, Father's Day is coming up, so if you make your way to Gov Fuller Field, make sure to get your Father's Day gear. So many amazing things for purchase at the Falmouth Commodores team store, and I got to tell you, Carter, when I got off the phone with my father, he said when he flies out here, he is going to unload at that store. So if you're able to come down to the field, you got to check out the Falmouth Commodore Merch Store, and especially in time for Father's Day. Levi Wells on for the third inning. And he has done a fantastic job out of the bullpen today, Carter. And we talked about it last inning. The top of each inning, he struck out the first batter he faced on three pitches. And more importantly, he's struck out the last batter he's faced in each inning. He's allowed one base runner in each but five strikeouts in two innings, nothing to sneeze at, and we've talked about why. Wells has got the fastball working today, and he's been throwing the breaking ball for strikes. He looks very comfortable, very at ease, and Chatham has yet to be able to break him out of his rhythm so far through two innings. And Jeff Trundy just sticking with what's working, sending Wells out for his third frame. First pitch delivered to the catcher. Tamez misses outside. The catcher walked back in the second and struck out back in the third inning. 1-0 pitch to Mez. Take strike one. Cole Crescent is now in the Falmouth Commodores bullpen warming up. Wells doing a fantastic job. Got the count even at 1-1. One and one. Two and one. And we can talk all we want about the, the stuff for Wells, but another aspect of what's been going well for him tonight is the command. I mean, he's pecking at that outside corner, trying with the fastball to see just how much home plate umpire Jeffrey Merzel is going to give him. Just a bit outside, three and one. And I do think Wells probably wanted to throw that pitch there to see if he could get 
to Mez to swing, or maybe if he can get that for a called strike, he wouldn't bite. Now let's see if he comes a little further in. 3-1 pitch misses up Sayers, and it's a leadoff walk for the Chatham A's catcher. Levi Wells has walked a batter coming into this inning, and that was his second one of the game. So now here comes Cooper Engel, who was a victim of Levi Wells' first punchy back in the fourth inning. I would have liked for him to be a little bit more aggressive on that 3-1 pitch. Foul behind the backstop. I think with the stuff Wells has had with the fastball, I think he was trying to throw that in the zone and it just tailed away a little high. But when you're up by three runs, you can trust your stuff. I mean, he's been Absolutely. nailed since he came in. You don't have to try to snap off a breaking ball on 3-1, but even if Tamez were to hit that ball over the fence, you're still up by two. The anglers need base runners, and now they have one. Oh, one pitch misses low. Well, the Chatham A's have had some base runners, quite a few of them, but they've only had two hits. One of those hits delivered the two runs on the scoreboard. That was the single from Thomas Caulfield. On a 1-1 pitch, Engel takes ball two. A little high, but a good spot there from Levi Wells. And Chatham's had a problem lately of leaving runners. They left seven on Tuesday. They've left six so far in this game. Bases loaded in the second and then one in each inning since then. 2-1. Cut on and miss, 2-2. Two and two. There's that fastball again for Wells. He's elevating it, and these hitters are struggling to lay off. I think he was trying to do the same to Tamez on that 3-1 pitch, but it just got a little bit too far inside with movement. I would like for him to come back with another here to try to get Engel to send him back to the dugout. Breaking ball is ripped to third. 5-4-3. Double play. And there are two gone here in the top of the sixth inning. And Wells didn't go to the fastball there like we were thinking, but I think he got inside the mind of Engel, who was sharing a similar thought. I think he was expecting the fastball, had to adjust on the breaking ball, and with how much has been moving, he just topped it, couldn't help but roll over in an easy double play for the Commodores, settling down this inning. That's in there for strike one, and that off the end of the bat went the other way. And we saw a double play turn to Gov Fuller on opening day. Braden Taylor in his first double play of the year. A one. Grounded to Ahuna. Under his glove. And it goes into center field. So the inning continues. And we'll see how they rule that. And it's going to be charge and error to Maui Ahuna, the second one on the Commodore's defense today. That's the we've talked about a, a little earlier how the air from Taylor over to Walsh wasn't really harmful. Let's hope this one is harmless as well. As that one's a little more of a noticeable error as Caulfield comes up and he has not been retired today. A pair of singles. Breaking ball's in there for strike one. Good pitch there. And Jeff Trundy hoping Wells can get him through this inning and then Maybe perhaps turn the ball over to Cole Crescent, who continues to warm up in the Falmouth Commodore pen. We'll pick off play back over to first as Walsh gathered fires. And again, that breaking ball just has some fangs to it tonight. These hitters have not been able to pick it up very well. It was the pitch that Engel grounded to the double play. Caulfield couldn't do anything with that first offering. Nothing into the count to Caulfield, who... Been very tough to put out today. Had that two-run single back in the second, but Levi Wells trying to get him here. Grice at first. Two-strike pitch. Called strike three. The sixth strikeout for Levi Wells. What a performance out of the bullpen. Five to two to the score as we go to the bottom of the sixth inning. What are you most looking forward to this season? 
most looking forward to working with all the interns. It's a really good group, and just a couple of days in, we've already started to bond over different things, the Celtics, hanging out with one another, and even the Red Sox as well. There's just so many different things that make this intern group seem like a really good one. Not just being around players that are our age, but being around a bunch of other people that are looking to get something great out of the Commodores. Um, but the favorite part about being like the intern specifically is the ability to like have some creative freedom because we're not under salary or anything like that. We're here to have fun, but also get work done. There's the perfect level of or balance of work and fun, but we don't get carried away with it. And I think that's the perfect part about being an intern. And the best part about being an intern, especially at the Commodores, is you get to watch baseball. Welcome back to Gov Fuller Field and happy Throwback Thursday, Commodore fans. Let's take it back to 2004, the year the Commodores made it to the Cape Cod Championship game. And also in that year was July 2nd. That was when the Commodores took on the Anglers at Veterans Field. And that night, it was P.J. Connolly that was not only one out away from a no-hitter, he was actually inches away. With two gone in the bottom of the ninth, a flare was hit to right field. And Daniel Cart fielded it in what a lot of Commodore fans, including head coach Jeff, Jeff Trundy, thought was an out. To this day, Jeff thinks it was an out, but you know what? That happens, and that's just baseball, Susan. Guys, back up to you. You're absolutely right, Trey. There's uh, a lot of history that goes back, and especially in these recent days with no hitters being broken up late in games. <laughs> Rings a bell a little too eerie right there as it, a new catcher for the Chatham Anglers comes in. It's the Nelson Rivera coming off the bench as Alex Mooney has got a 1-1 count as he grounds that one to third. Herrera across the diamond. And Mooney is out via the tag. Great recovery there from the first baseman, Noah Ledford, on a bad throw by Herrera. So it's a routine on the scorebook, at least, 5-3 ground out. But it's a play you're not surprised was made by Mooney when you look at who it was. And Mooney so far this season has been a spark plug on offense, but it's also because he's played hard. He's running down the line quickly. He tried it there. One to know here. Regalado still on to work for the Chatham A's. Regalado, who entered this game back in the fourth inning, has yet to give up a base hit. Two and oh. He has walked three Commodore batters, though. Braden Taylor. Walked twice today, so a one-for-one one day. He is ahead in the count 3-0. and oh. I talked about all those walks early on, Carter, about during the season at TCU. Does he have a third right here? Indeed he does. Third of the day drawn by Braden Taylor as Maui Ahuna will enter. Chatham's pitching staff hasn't been interested in dealing with Taylor today, his third walk of the day. And it's just an interesting tone this game has taken on. The starters in this game, early relief, not effective, but these two arms out of the bullpen have really settled down. Maui Ahuna struck out looking back in the second. But Taylor's lone hit, as you mentioned, Carter, it's been a big one. It was that run scoring single. Nothing and two, the count now to Maui Ahuna. And it seems like the count is nothing and two for him when he started his at bats. Just what happens when you're not going well. He's been taking a lot of swings and misses, an unfamiliar spot for him. He didn't strike out all that much at Kansas. Oh, two. Cut on and miss strike three. It's the third strikeout for Regalado. And that's going to bring up the center fielder. Andrew Pinckney. I think with some of these new hitters that you see making their debuts with the Commodores, not only today but in you know future days, you're going to see them adjust. Ahuna had to do it on 
Tuesday, and he struck out again twice today. Pinckney already with two Ks, so you're going to see some guys adjusting once they get up here. The problem the first three games was that everybody was doing it at once. 1-0 the count now as that fastball gets away. Pinckney had that weird fielder's choice back in the first inning. That was before the days of our broadcast when it was set up. That ball's a little low. But Chatham Angler's defense thought they had a double play as he beat the throw at first, and Braden Taylor scored. 2-0. 2-1. And that's exactly why uh, you never quit on the plane. You never celebrate too early, partner. Yeah, I think Chatham thought they had a double play, almost as if they were waiting for the call to end the inning, and they just forgot they had a guy streaking around third in Braden Taylor. 2-1 is spoiled foul, 2-2. Two and two. But that play was a product of Pinckney putting the ball in play in the first place. Commodores right. couldn't do a whole lot on Tuesday when they struck out 17 times, and there were quite a few at-bats in that game. The other 10 where they made outs where they looked absolutely overwhelmed, particularly by some hot fastballs coming in from those Mariner pitchers. 2-2 two -two pitch. Cut on and missed strike three. Regalado has himself his fourth K as we go to the seventh inning. Still five to two. We'll be right back, and Carter will take it the rest of the way. Looking forward to the most with the Commodores is just the chance to work with some really talented people, whether that be on the broadcast team or any other interns. I'm a part of the broadcast team, so I get to work with Trey and Logan, uh, and I think that both of them are just super talented. I'm really happy I get to work with both of them because I feel like I'll learn as much from them as they will from me, and I'm just really excited to uh, be able to improve my craft with two guys who are focused on the exact same thing. My favorite part about being a Commodore intern is that I get to work on not only my videography skills, but also meet and work with other people that are really dedicated to the field of work. I think just having the opportunity to work with a lot of people that are interested in the sports media business, especially when it comes to baseball, this is the premier league for collegiate players. And I think that getting the opportunity to work with a lot of people from across the country to have this one bond and the love is for baseball and helping these players develop, I think it's going to be something really cool and it's going to be an amazing experience. Welcome back to Gulf Fuller Field, where the Falmouth Commodores are trying to close out their first victory of the summer. They lead it 5-2 to two over the Chatham Anglers right now. As the sun sets here at the Gov, the Commodores bring on their third pitcher of the day, right-hander Cole Crescent out of the University of Louisiana Monroe. Crescent making his second appearance of the summer. Big, tall right-hander trying to Hold the anglers off for at least one more inning. Already this summer, Crescent with an inning and two-thirds under his belt, allowed two hits, walked one and struck out one, opening day against the Harwich Mariners. So lost in the shuffle of that defeat, Crescent put up a scoreless outing, and now he's asked to do the same again. With the Chatham Anglers cold at the plate, they have not scored since a two-run single back in the top of the second from second baseman Thomas Caulfield. But, Logan, I think that uh, Commodores are going to need a little bit more than five to feel comfortable in this game. Oh, absolutely. We talked about it back in the first inning in the game of baseball, the beautiful game of baseball. There is no safe lead. As we have a pinch hitter for the... Chatham Anglers. Guy Garibay Jr., outfielder, pinch hitting for Nate Nankill, who ends his day 0 for 2 with a walk. So Garibay, his first action in today. And we were told by uh, our friends on the Chatham media team that the Anglers like to use pinch hitters. They told us to be on the lookout for guys coming in later in the game. And now we have our first at the plate. We've already had a defensive change at catcher for the Anglers. Now Crescent deals. First offering low to Garibay, and it's ball one. So Garibay, a sophomore at Rice this spring, taking his cuts in the count 
One and zero. Oh. Crescent fires in a strike, and it's one and one. He made a stellar play in the outfield the other day at Veterans Field. Full extension, robbing a hit and a run. On the one one, breaking ball floats inside, and it's two and one. So. Good fielding from Garibay, but he's been bitten by the hitting bug that seems to have afflicted so many so far in this Cape Cod season. So far this summer, he's 0 for 7. 2 1 up high, and it's 3 and 1. So, termites in your bat. Doesn't matter if you can draw walks, and Garibay, one miss from Crescent here away from doing just that. Three one. Down the pipe for a strike, and the count is full. Now the payoff pitch. Fastball lined into left center field, hard into the gap. It's a base hit for Garibay. Pinckney over to get it, his throw strong back in, and it holds Garibay to a long single to lead off the top of the seventh inning. What a play by Pinckney out in center field. Running and basically sprinting as if he was running the 100-meter dash to his right. Cut it off and held them just to one base. It's the first hit for the Chatham A's offense since the fourth inning. Pinckney with a nice defensive play. He was a great fielder at Alabama this spring as Crescent deals with Marcus Brown, the shortstop. Breaking ball low. And the count is 1-0. Pinckney this spring at Alabama did not make an error in 117 chances and led the Crimson Tide in assists. So he's got the speed and he's got the arm. And perhaps Garibay knew that and didn't want to try him. Crescent's second delivery is again low and it's 2-0. Yeah, and it's the first time we've seen Pinckney not just in the Falmouth lineup but also in center field. We've seen cross-factor the first three games. So a great job out there cutting it off. Brown has made a nice couple defensive plays today, but he's been quiet at the plate so far 0 for 3. Swings and misses at that offering, and it's 2 and 1. Brown going down to a knee on a hitter's count, and that's how things have been going for the Chatham offense tonight. Unable to scratch out runs since the second inning. All zeros since. Round two for 10 on the summer, including tonight. 2 1 pitch again, misses inside for Crescent, who has to be careful here. If he puts Brown on, the tying run will come to the plate in the form of Chuck Ingram, who is 0 for 2 today. Now the 3 1. Lined hard into right field, a base hit. Single for Brown, Garibay goes on to second, and there's two on with nobody away here in the top of the seventh inning. And another pinch hitter for Chatham, coming in for Chuck Ingram, it's Matthew Hogan. Matthew Hogan just completing his senior season at South Carolina. Had not the best season he would have liked, hitting 137 on 17 starts and 39 games. One home run, one double, one triple. Struck out 21 times, but he's on the cape for a reason. And the book on him so this summer, so far not deep either. He's two for three in two games, has also drawn a walk. Has hit into a double play already this summer. So Cole Crescent, allowing a single and a walk to start the top of the second, has brought the tying run to the plate in a 5-2 game. Left-handed hitting Matthew Hogan digging in. First pitch to him, tails inside, and it's 1-0. and oh. Well, they're countering. They're putting lefties in the batter's box to go against the right-hander Crescent. We saw Brown pull that one into right. 1-0, fastball not close, up high and away, and it's 2-0. And, oh. and if you fall behind hitters, Logan, bad things do happen. Now we talked about that back when Grayson Hitt had three walks. 
Just got to be careful here. And the 2-0. Inside again and low, and Hogan has not come close to offering it any of these pitches. It's 3-0 on the Chatham outfielder. Well, now he has to really attack. He should have with 2-0. Try and get that ground ball. You need that double play. Infield that double play depth for Falmouth. The 3-0. Up high for ball four, and Crescent stays away. Hogan able to draw the walk, and the bases are loaded with nobody out for Noah Ledford. Now Mikey Tepper in the bullpen for the Falmouth Commodores as assistant coach Ryan Eiley comes on out and talks to Crescent with nobody out. What did we say at the beginning of this frame, that it might take more than five runs yeah. for the Commodores to feel comfortable in this game? It just feels like, or felt like, that Chatham was going to break out eventually for a little more. They haven't been one of the worst teams in the Cape League so far this summer hitting-wise, and you talked about Rock Riggio, who's not here yet from Oklahoma State. That guy's rallying a can, and they're only going to get better once he shows up. But so far... They need better than what they've gotten tonight. However, they have a good candidate coming up to the plate to try to do some damage. And Noah Ledford, the switch hitting first baseman, as Crescent exits the game. His day done. So he comes in and cannot get an out. He loads the bases on two walks and a hit. And we'll see what the Commodore's plan is here in a moment. Looks like Tepper. Mikey Tepper making his second appearance of the summer. Pitched two innings already against Katuit. Allowed an earned run, one hit, struck out one. But that hit was a big one. It was a home run by Justin Mickness that allowed the Cataliers to increase their lead in what was eventually a 4 to nothing Katuit win. So Tepper, hard thrower from Mississippi State. Mid-90s fastball and a low 80s breaking ball. And those pitches are going to have to be working for him here in the top of the seventh inning for the doors to get out of this jam. Yeah, good time to remind you what we got coming the rest of the week. The Falmouth Commodores are on the road at Hyannis tomorrow. And Saturday they'll be at Wareham. And then we got our first doubleheader of the season, seven innings each game against Orleans right here at Gov Fuller. And then Tuesday after the off day, we are at Veterans Field, taking on the Chatham Anglers again. And then we go to Lowell Park for the first time this season on Wednesday. I'll be at 5 p.m. Lowell Park not having lights, so it'll be a little bit earlier. Likewise, the next, the next day we should say that games take place as we go to Brewster to take on the defending champs at 5 p.m. So, nice busy week coming up. One thing worth mentioning here is that they're letting Tepper take warm-up pitches on the mound, which suggests that Crescent left because of injury. Otherwise, they would have had to wait, have a mound visit, and then bring in Tepper like normal. But instead, perhaps something wrong with Crescent, and Tepper's been given all the time he wants. We saw this earlier in the game when Hayden Dirk was struck by that comebacker. It was Molsky who came in after him, and... Warmed up for a good while. And Tepper's got to make these warm-up pitches count because he's in a mess of trouble. Three runners left on base for him. Yeah, his first appearance that he had on the Cape. One game, two innings, only gave up one hit. and gave up one earned run, but he struck out one. That's so Stuff looked yeah. good. He just got one hanger tattooed by Mickness. Catcher for Katuit what was overall a pretty sour-tasting day for Falmouth, getting shut out by their main rivals here at Gov Fuller Field. And you can't get mad at the home run that was given up just because the lack of offense that day. So now he's got to bear down and do some work here, and it all starts with the first baseman, Noah Ledford. 
Noah Ledford, redshirt junior this spring at Georgia Southern, hit 348 with an OPS over 1,100, 17 home runs, 70 RBI for the Eagles. And can draw his walks as well. He's a patient hitter. Has drawn a walk today, did it his last time up in the fifth. And this is a guy I got to watch quite a bit last summer in the Coastal Plain League. So I know just how dangerous this guy is. Seems like every time he came up against the team I was working for, it was a double or a walk. First pitch from Tepper is spiked in the dirt, and it's 1-0. and And for Ledford, no reason to take the bat off his shoulder until he gets something to hit. Just about anything he does here will play to run. Tepper in a jam. Infield in at the corners, and the 1-0. Fastball in for a strike, and it's 1-1. One and one. Heater clocking in at 92 miles an hour from Tepper, similar to what we saw against Katua. The stuff was there. Overall, a solid outing, and he's going to have to have another here for Falmouth to escape this inning with a multi-run lead. 1-1. One, one. Breaking ball, check swing by Ledford, and he did go, says home plate umpire Jeffrey Merzel. No check. So Tepper, who struck out 29 in 24 and two-thirds this spring with the Bulldogs, looking for a big K in the books now with one and two on Ledford, and nobody out. Bases loaded, top of the seventh. One, two, well inside, and it skips away, but not before hitting Ledford, and that plate's a run. On one and two, Ledford hit. Garibay comes in to score. Brown to third, Hogan to second, and an ominous start for Tepper. It's now five to three. Well, just when he thought the count was starting to go in his way. But now you have the same approach. What are you going to ask Mikey Tepper about the perfect scenario? He's going to say, strikeout and a double play ball. So that's what his approach was there, being ahead in the count one and two. So now he's got to do it all over again against Herrera. Adonis Herrera, 0 for 3 today. Swings and misses at a fastball, and it's 0 and 1 on the Chatham third baseman. And the pitch that came inside and hit Ledford looked like a breaking ball that let, or that uh, Tepper released just a little too late. Ended up sailing inside to plunk. Ledford in the left-handed batter's box. He now stands at first in the 0-1. Fouled straight back, 0-2. Tepper ahead in the count once again. Trying this time to put away Herrera. Infield for the Commodores, again in on the corners. Taylor at third, Walsh at first, both with their cleats on the infield grass. The 0-2. Breaking ball, it gets away from DeCunto. Runner coming to the plate, and he is out at the plate. Marcus Brown got a little too aggressive, and there's that backstop coming back into play. I was waiting for you to say that. Tricky bounce came right back to DeCunto, and he was well ahead of Brown, who tried charging home. Both Hogan and Ledford do advance, but a huge first out here in the top of the seventh. And Herrera still at the plate, down one and two. Infield now at normal depth. A one-two. Line drive, base hit left field. Hogan comes in to score. Ledford puts the brakes on at third. And all of a sudden, it's a one-run game on the RBI single by Adonis Herrera. Two-strike hitting. Hung one over the plate. Not necessarily a slower one, but just one that he could sit on his back foot and just drive into left field. Now he's really got to bear down and find a way to keep the first baseman Ledford over at third. Double play still available. First and third, one out, top of the seventh inning, but Tepper needs a big pitch to Nelson Rivera. First pitch to him is popped up out of play, back of the plate, and it's 0-1. Rivera came in as a defensive replacement in the bottom of the sixth inning. 
and now stays in for his first at bat of the day. So the evening is over for Dominic Tamez. 0 for 1 with a strikeout and two walks on the night. And Rivera getting his first hacks. 0 1. Runner goes from first. There goes Herrera. The throw down is in time. Herrera gunned down at second base on a strong throw from Angelo DeCunto. And the Anglers doing their very best to run themselves out of this inning. Well, you still got to be careful because anything in that outfield ties this game. So now a pop-up could do it too. Ledford at third, the tying run. Fouled back by Rivera again. Five to four, the Commodores lead. Two outs here, top of the seventh. It was Cole Crescent who loaded the bases. The first three hitters reached. He left the game in favor of Mikey Tepper, who's trying to extinguish the fire. And he's a strike away with Rivera at the plate. The one-two. Breaking ball. Got him looking! Rivera will grab some pine. Tepper gets out of it, and the Commodores still lead it 5-4 to four as we head to the bottom of the seventh. Hey there, Commodore fans. Thanks for joining us and cheering on your Falmouth Commodores. Want to take a break from the action? Come make a visit to the merchandise booth. Check us out behind home plate. We have a bunch of new designs for you to purchase, from hats to shirts, jerseys, crewnecks, wine glasses, and even baby bibs. You think of it, we probably have it, from youth sizes to even adult double XLs. We have everything you need for family and friends. Be sure to come say hello and get a piece of Falmouth merch. Make a trip before we close up shop in the ninth inning. See you soon, and roll doors. And what's your hottest take? Welcome back to Gov Fuller Field, and this one between the Falmouth Commodores and the Chatham Anglers shaping up to be a real hummer on this Thursday night. It's 5-4. to four. The Doors led comfortably heading into the top of this seventh inning before the Anglers played it two, but were unable to get out of their own way. Two runners thrown out after le le uh, loading the bases with nobody out, I should say. So now with the Doors up by a run, Chatham brings in a new pitcher. It's right-hander Matt Peters relieving Nicholas Regalado, who went three scoreless, three hitless innings, walked three, struck out four, and stymied the Falmouth offense for long enough. But now the Doors trying to spark something with the last three frames they've put up on the board, all zeros. A couple of defensive replacements is... Guy Garibay Jr., who had his first at bat last inning, he is now in left field. And then Matt Hogan, who had his first at bat, he is now in right field. So now the word Carter insurance comes into play. And I inadvertently said insurance back in the, in the first or second inning, but I felt that no lead is safe. So now it's going to be up to Jacob Walsh to Get something going late. Jacob Walsh, the Commodore first baseman, stands in to lead things off against Peters here in the bottom of the seventh inning. Walsh today one for one with two walks. He and Braden Taylor have had spectacular debuts today. Peters peering in in his first delivery. Fastball clips the zone, and it's 0-1. And a high-scoring day across the Cape lead. League, I should say, Wareham scoring plenty of runs today, hanging 11 on Hyannis. Brewster with six. Walsh fouls that one back. And the count 0-2, but 
Someone out there has got to stop the Kettleers. Mm. They're beating up on Bourne again today, six to nothing. So all of a sudden, the bats around the league coming to life. Maybe that off day really was what all these players needed. 0-2 oh on Walsh. Peters ahead. 0-2. Oh fouled off the opposite way. And it stays 0-2. Oh Orleans must have missed the invite as they're currently being shut out by Brewster. 6 to nothing. As did Harwich and YD locked up in a scintillating 2-1 to one game. Walsh will try again to put something in play. Down 0-2. Spiked in the dirt and through the legs of Rivera. It's one and two. And Peters, a, a guy you don't want to face if he's being a little wild because out at Ivy Tech Community College this spring, he has been clocked as high as 101 miles an hour with his fastball. Usually sits in the mid to high 90s. But according to Ivy Tech, he hit that top velocity, 101, March 5th of this year. 1-2. Misses high, and it's 2-2. Two and two. So Peters, with good height, throwing not only his limbs at the plate in that delivery, but a serious heater as well. Walsh is going to have to put all those skills at Oregon to use here. Get on base to start the seventh. 2-2. Two, two. Swing and a miss. Peters climbing the ladder on him. Walsh retired for the first time today, and he's the first out in the bottom of the seventh. Well, Matt Peters went to one of the more dominant high schools out in Southern California, and he was actually, just like myself, born in Pasadena, California. So it's good to see two Pasadena kids out on the Cape. Not so good when he retires one of your guys in a very good fashion via way of the K. First pitch breaking ball to factor buckles a little bit. So you're both from Pasadena. How did he end up with all the arm talent? Well, here's the thing. I, I That's the beauty of this. I didn't know this kid existed until looking him up in the Cape. Loyola being one of those schools out in Los Angeles, and they're such a powerhouse, usually in the Mission League. They're in the league with Notre Dame, which is one of the leagues where, you know, Hunter Green is from, John Carlos Stanton went in, Harvard Westlake's also in that league, where Lucas Giolito – Max Freed and Jack Flaherty all went. So that Mission League in Southern California in high school, that's a product of some good baseball players. Peters dealing with Cross Factor, who just had to flinch his way out of a 2-0 fastball that trailed well inside, and it's 3-0. and And speaking of good baseball, Peters was just that this spring at Ivy Tech. Limited time, only six appearances, but... Pitched 30 and a third, a 3.56 ERA, struck out 54. So he's got the stuff. Control sometimes an issue. 3 and 0 here on factor as well. And up high for ball four. Four pitch walk to the Commodore left fielder. And there's one on with one out for Kyle Russell. Rather, pinch hitter in his place, Colby Halter. Another Commodore making his summer debut tonight. Halter pinch hitting for Russell here in the bottom of the seventh. Halter lefty bat coming in for the righty Russell. The first pitch up high. Peters having some trouble getting that fastball down, and it's 1-0. and See, there's a reason why you asked, and I had no idea who he was. He's from Indiana. I knew there was a cross up there. There's another Matt Peters you were thinking Appar of? Apparently. One out on the outside corner, and it's one and one to Halter, left-handed hitting infielder from Jacksonville, Florida. Just finished up a long season with the Florida Gators, started 65 games. That's a lot of baseball, especially down in a state with temperatures and the mercury that rise that hot. Hit 240 for the Gators this spring. One one. Down low, and it's the north and south control bothering Peters right now. 94 on the gun with the fastball, but he's been struggling with the control. Either it sits high or he's tried to get it down, and it's been too far down. And that does not take away from the product of the Mission League, I will say that. 
But right now, Peter's looking for that double play ball if you're Chatham. It's 2 1 delivery. Swing and a miss. Halter unable to catch up. And the count even at 2 and 2. And this is Spot with a one run lead. One away. Commodore's certainly been inclined to run before. Cross factor, a guy who. Stole bases effectively at Oklahoma City University this spring. 19 for 20 on steel tries. Just depends on how aggressive Coach Trundy wants to be. 2-0 pitch up high again, but I guess there's your risk, right? Peter's a guy struggling to get the fastball down. If he misses high, that's about as picture-perfect a pitch as Rivera would want to try to throw out a would-be base stealer. Well, that's where you look for that snap from the pitcher's release. Factor to this point is given no indication that he's trying to go. Modest lead. Over at first, and the 3-2, and there he goes. But it's ball four anyway. Halter heads on to first. And it's the second walk of the inning for Matt Peters. Second straight walk. Two on, one out in the bottom of the seventh. And Drew Brutcher coming to the plate. he looks like he's walking up to his pitcher. He looks like he's going to grab that ball, but we'll see. I mean, he could just be cold. Well, it is a chilly night here, after all. We were surprised yeah. by the temperature when we came out to the field this afternoon. It's been a cloudy day. It was cloudy at first pitch. And that breeze we feel coming through the press box every now and then, along with the sleeves on some of these players, tells you that this isn't your ideal July afternoon out on the Cape. Man, don't wish time away on me that fast. We're still in June. <laughs> I don't want to leave the Cape just yet. Well, the weather was like this when we first got here. It was. Yeah, we, we were talking about this when we, we drove over the Bourne Bridge yesterday, how we could see a lot more. When we came in on the Cape, it was overcast and cloudy. But a beautiful scene tonight, and what should be a pretty awesome finish of this ball game as Brutcher climbs, climbs in with a pretty good night under his belt. And Peters staying in despite the conference on the mound with two on, one out, bottom of the seventh, and the Commodores up by only a run. Chatham just played a two in the top of this frame. Peters looking back. His first delivery to Brutcher. Swing and a miss. Went after a fastball up high and couldn't catch up. It's 0-1. the summer debut for Matt Peters after his spring out at Ivy Tech Community College in Indiana. Trying to get out of a jam of his own creation. The 0-1. Swing and a miss again. Brutcher late on the heat both times. 95 that time from Peters, and it's 0-2. Factor at second, Halter at first. One away. Brutcher looking for his third hit of the day and his second RBI. Peters checking on factor. And the 0-2. Breaking ball on the inside corner for strike three called, and Brutcher do it. He heads back to the dugout. First strikeout in the books for Peters. Second strikeout, rather. First looking. And DeCunto now comes to the plate with two on and two down. It's going to be a pinch hitter stepping in. It's going to be Cody Colden. Another move by Coach Trundy. So now Jeff Trundy countering by bringing some of his hitters off the bench as well. Certainly didn't see this on Tuesday, but he smells a run here. As Colden takes strike one, a breaking ball for Peters, and he's now getting that pitch over. Struck out Brutcher with one of them and starts Colden with another. It's a tenuous inning here at Gov Fuller Field as the Commodores try to scratch out another run. They lead by just one as Colden calls time. And the run scoring potential in this inning resting in his bat right now. 
With good speed on fa second and factor, a base hit may score no matter how shallow it is. The 0 1, check swing, and Colden did not go after it. It's 1 and 1. Cody Colden does have a hit in two games played coming into today. But he has struck out twice. Teammates with Kyle Russell at Washington State. Colden one for four entering this game. And the 1-1 one -one to him is a little bit outside and low, and it's two and one. So we've seen moves made tonight by both managers, Tom Holliday for Chatham and Jeff Trundy for Falmouth. A lot of hitters brought in to try to get the platoon advantage, but Colden not one of them. He's batting right-handed against the righty Peters. Not a switch hitter, so strictly a move to get some other look in there via another hitter. 2-1, chopped softly, third base side. Going to be a tough play for Herrera, who can't pick it up. Colden probably would have been safe anyway, but Herrera at third. Unable to pick the ball. And the base is loaded with two down. Infield single, factor to third, halter to second. Even if he had gloved that ball, he was safe by about a mile. So now big spot here for Mooney. Needs some insurance. Off the bat, you knew it right away. Mm -hmm. Peters' his first delivery to Mooney. Breaking ball and a good one on the outside corner to the right-handed Mooney. It's 0-1, and, and of all the candidates that Peters would likely pick to face in this situation, you have to figure Mooney would be pretty low on that list. He's been swinging the bat well so far this season. One for three today with a walk. 0-1. Swing and a miss. Peters coming after Mooney, not with the heat, but with his off-speed offerings, and both times Mooney has sold out for a pitch he didn't get. we got to be careful here. The Commodores have stranded eight runners on base. It could go to 11. Trying to avoid that. Base is loaded, two down in the 0-2. Fouled back. Mooney had to go up and get that offering, and it stays 0-2. And that's how you stay in the count, and that's how you keep your at-bat going. Second baseman for Chatham, Caulfield, playing fairly deep with his feet on the shallow right field grass. Now he comes in a step or two. Base is loaded, two down. Matt Peters trying to get out of this jam. He deals. Popped up on the infield. Caulfield coming in. Calling for it and has it as he stumbles back, but that ends the inning. Bases loaded for the Commodores, and they do not capitalize. As we head to the top of the eighth, the Doors lead it 5-4. to four.
Well, we've got a barn burner for you here at Gov Fuller Field. The Falmouth Commodores lead the Chatham Anglers 5-4 to four as we head to the top of the eighth inning. Mikey Tepper, Commodore right-hander, back on the mound for inning number two. He was able to keep the Anglers relatively at bay in their last frame after coming into a bases-loaded no-out jam. The A's still scored two, but the Doors still lead. And Cooper Engel takes a strike, and it's 0-1. Engel today 0 for 2, has walked once. Chatham looking for some offense from him as this season goes along, that's for sure. Breaking ball skips in front of the plate, and it's 1-1. One and one. Also grounded into that double play that was initiated by Braden Taylor over at third. 1-1 one, one from Tepper. On the ground to second base. Mooney, nice backhand pick, and the throw in time. One away in the top of the eighth. And Caden Grice, the batter. Always have to wait and see this late in games mm -hmm. with all the pinch hitters, but Grice, a pretty recognizable guy. He's got some serious height at six foot six. With one away, base is empty. Tepper fires. And it's in for a strike, 0 and 1. A little something off speed from Tepper at 84 miles an hour. And the 0 1. Swing and a miss. 0 and 2 now, the count on Grice who's hitless today and two at-bats, walked back in the second. He had all those strikeouts, 94 at Clemson this year, five coming into today, has yet to strike out. Trying to get him here for the first time. Tepper's got the look, doesn't he? Up 0-2 in the count. He wants it. The 0-2. Down low and inside, and pretty good pitch to try to do it with, but Grice able to lay off. And a pretty good count to do it with as well. Being ahead, nothing and two. Now he's a little more cautious, but still attacking. We see Joey Ryan, Commodore right-hander, warming in the bullpen. One, two, breaking ball in there for strike three called. Grice takes his seat, out number two here in the top of the eighth. Second strike out of the game for Tepper. And Thomas Caulfield now steps to the plate. Two down, base is empty for Caulfield, who's two for three today. Drove in a pair with his first hit back in the second. Tepper's first offering. Breaking ball in for a strike. And the count 0-1, but Caulfield, certainly not a guy that you want to dismiss in the number nine spot, especially not after two hits today, but a guy who hit 16 home runs this spring at Millersville. 0-1 is rocketed foul right side, and there's that power on cue that I was just about to mention. Caulfield last summer in a wood bat league in the Coastal Plain League hit 11 home runs, which ranked near the top of the league for one of the higher scoring teams in the league in High Point, Thomasville. Now behind in the count, 0-2. Tepper's delivery is fouled back. Caulfield did just get a piece of it, but saw plenty of blasts by Caulfield out there at Ashboro that were hit that hard and stayed fair. Mm. Yeah. Well, now Tepper's got to be working here, using that curveball with the righty on lefty. It's been working for him recently. He's got a change up as well, and the 0-2 swing and a foul back. It's 0-2 again, but with a left-handed hitter in Caulfield up, that's when you want to use that change mm. if you're a right-handed pitcher. Well, Cozart, the new catcher, unable to squeeze that one for strike three, so now Tepper will do it again. 0-2. Swing and a miss. Caulfield down on strikes, and that looked like the changeup from Tepper for out number three here in the top of the eighth. The Anglers go down one, two, three. Two more Ks in the books for Tepper, and we head to the bottom of the eighth inning. The Doors hanging on by a run.
What's your hottest take? Hottest take? Hottest take is that a straw has two holes, not one. What is your favorite place in Falmouth? My favorite place in Falmouth right now, I would say is uh, Shoreway Acres Inn. Uh, a bunch of us of uh, the interns are staying there and like we're having such a great time getting to know each other. Can you give me your best British accent? Scott Sterling. Is cereal a soup? No, it's cereal. It's its own thing, right? What what soup would be I with milk in it? Is this the last time for the Commodores at bat in this game? They sure hope so. Up by a run as we head to the bottom of the eighth inning. And the Doors leading 5-4 to four over the Chatham Anglers. It's been quite a game here tonight. The closest game the Doors have had all season. They've certainly hit well in this one, but they haven't scored since the bottom of the third. Braden Taylor, the third baseman and number two hitter, now stands in. Hoping to change that here in the bottom of the eighth against right-hander Matt Peters on for inning number two. Matt Peters from Indiana did a good job getting out of that jam back in the seventh inning. But Braden Taylor having one of the more uh, cumbersome 1,000 batting averages on the season because he's got the three walks and the single tonight. So a solid one for one. Sure seems like of all the players in the lineup, Chatham, not willing to let Taylor beat them. At least not willing to throw him a lot of strikes as Peters misses down low for ball one. But Taylor's debut, certainly pleasantly surprising. One for one with three walks. Been on base, and that's exactly what the Commodores needed after that team-wide offensive slump the first three games. 1-0. Off the fists, into the hole at second base. Caulfield makes the throw and beats Taylor by a step. One away. Oh, you couldn't have said it any better. Literally a step. We've seen some good infield defense from the Anglers tonight. A couple good plays over at short by Marcus Brown. Thomas Caulfield, who plays around the infield, able to make that play at second base look fairly routine. And now Maui Ahuna with the bases empty and one away. Crouched stance in the left-handed box. On the outside corner for a strike. Ahuna, not a fan of that call, but he'll have to fight back already with two strikeouts to his credit tonight. The 0 1. Peters leaving it high, and it's 1 and 1. Back to what you were talking about, Carter, on the fielding. Chatham has yet to commit an error, Thomas has committed two. 1-1 one, one from Peters. Swing and a miss. Again, Ahuna going up for that fastball. Has not been able to catch up with it as of yet. The Commodores entered the day last in the league in drawing walks. They had only six through their first three games. Since the third inning alone in this game, they've drawn six free passes but have not been able to score. Ahuna late on that swing but did get a piece. Fouled it off towards the Chatham dugout. It's one and two on the Commodore shortstop, who's one for three today with a walk. So Ahuna getting it going a little bit here today, more so than he did on Tuesday. That rainbow sheen glinting in the light here with the sun set at the Gov. One, two up high, and it's two and two. Well, he needs a good at bat here because he does not want to strike out for the seventh time in two games. Peters peering in, trying to get through his second scoreless inning. Breaking ball, swing and a miss. Ahuna down on strikes again. Two away here, bottom of the eighth inning. Commodore still up by a run, and Andrew Pinckney rolls up to the plate, try to mount a two-out threat.
Pinckney still looking for his first hit of the summer. When he reached in the first, not a base hit, reached on a fielder's choice and has struck out in each of his last three at bats since. Breaking ball on the outside corner. Not much Pinckney could do with that pitch, but spit on it, and it's 0 and 1. Commodores tonight still playing like they have some holes in their bats. 17 Ks on Tuesday, 12 so far tonight. That breaking ball further outside, and Pinckney didn't bite at it. It's 1 and 1. That's fascinating. Still late. And you're up 5-4. Off of some good offense in the first three innings. 1-1, one, one, swing and a miss. And again, Pinckney going down fishing for that low and away breaking ball. That's pretty much bedeviled him here tonight. Now down on the count, 1-2. and two. On deck, Jacob Walsh, who singled and walked twice tonight, did strike out his last time up against Peters. But first, Pinckney has to get something out of this at bat. Fastball did just miss the outside corner. Peters finally giving Pinckney a heater, but too far away, and it's 2-2. Two and two. Pinckney just trying to extend the inning. 2-2. Two and two. Down low, and you hear the grunt from Matt Peters as he delivers the fastball. Well, back to what you were saying about the, the velo just an inning ago. That was a hard one. They tried to just throw it as hard as he could, just a little low. It was either really low or really high in his first inning of work. I'd wager he goes back to the breaking ball here again, the 3-2. He doesn't, and it's outside for ball four. Pinckney on base for the second time today, this time via walk of the two-out variety here in the bottom of the eighth, and Jacob Walsh now comes up. Needs some sort of insurance. Joey Ryan's been great out in the bullpen in his first appearance, but two runs are better than one. Pinckney at first. First offering to Walsh. Swing and a miss on a breaking ball down and in. Nasty stuff from Peters. And the problem now is that he could have gotten out of this inning, could have Peters, if he had just retired. Pinckney, a right-handed hitter, had him way out in front on a couple breaking balls and then lost him. Now he's got a pitch to a lefty in Walsh. Swinging a high drive, left field. Garibay coming back in for it after he was tailing back. And it's out number three. A loud third out off the bat of Walsh. And we head to the top of the ninth inning. Commodores up by a run and in search of their first win of the summer. Want a house of Falmouth Commodore? Be sure to sign up to become a host family today. Hosting a Cape League player can be very rewarding. Players connect and bond with the families, often forming lifelong relationships. Please remember that every Commodores player is bound and governed by NCAA rules and regulations. In order to maintain their collegiate athletic ability, host families receive a weekly allowance from the Falmouth Commodores to help cover player expenses. Host families are not required to provide transportation to players. The Falmouth Commodores are very grateful to the wonderful families that host our players each and every year. If you are interested in hosting a Falmouth Commodores player for the summer, contact our housing coordinator, Lisa Smuda, at lisatz143 at comcast.net. For more information, visit our website at falmouthcommodores.com. Thank you for supporting our players and roll doors. The Chatham Anglers are about to come back up for their last time at bat, no matter what happens in this game. But right now, they're trying to mount a comeback down a run in the top of the ninth inning to the Falmouth Commodores. You see our videographers getting it on in one of the boxes, dancing in hopes of a first Commodore victory of the summer. And you can't blame them if they're excited. Plenty of fans here are trying to see the doors close out what would be win number one after a tough 0-3 start. And to do that, they give the ball to right-hander Joey Ryan on for his second appearance of the summer. 
and looking for a save. Well, the first save opportunity comes with a first win opportunity when it's less than three runs. So it's going to be close, but Ryan was fantastic in his first game, which was on opening day, an inning and two-thirds, two hits. The run that scored was unearned. Three punchies and a zero ERA. Ryan looked good when we first saw him, especially in his first inning of work. He struck out the side in the top of the sixth inning on opening day. And the doors hedging their bets, pushing their chips to the middle of the table that he can do it here again and protect a one-run lead. Commodores got off to a hot start in this game. Two in the first, one in the second, two in the third, but a silent Commodore offense in the last five innings let the Anglers draw this one closer with a pair in the second and a pair in the seventh. Third baseman Taylor in as Garibay stands in and sees ball one dribble to the backstop. It's 1-0. and oh. Garibay off the bench back in the seventh inning had that leadoff single that started that inning that brought them back to this game. So you got to be careful with him. And evidence that every at bat matters, a consequence of that seventh inning, as Ryan feels the 1 0, soft line drive down the left field line, foul. Just foul. Everyone's soul left their body, and it came right back when that was foul, because that would have been trouble. Not only a, a good piece of hitting, but that probably would have rolled the way the rules are in Gov Fuller that might have rolled out of play onto the hill beyond the quote-unquote warning track, the gravel that is behind the grass. Would have probably been two bases for Garibay, who now has to come back. Low, they check with the third base umpire, Tim Reiner, and Garibay didn't go. It's two and two. So Chatham, if they lose this game, they're going to be looking at that baseball for some chalk on it. See if it hit the foul line. One and two the count on Garibay, rather. Swing and a miss. Garibay still alive. Two and two the count now, we should say. After some scoreboard snafus, and the count even on the Chatham outfielder. I'm stealing that one. Scoreboard snafus. That's 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 a first. Ryan's 2-2. Two -two. Popped up softly on the infield. Taylor and Ahuna. It's Taylor to take it for out number one. And Garibay harmlessly retired to start the ninth. And to that point, Logan, that I was making before that foul ball that Garibay hit, one of the things that that seventh inning caused when Crescent let the first three hitters reach is that it extended that inning. The eighth inning ended with the seven, eight, and nine hitters. Commodores could potentially be facing them instead of the top of the order in this ninth if Crescent had gone one, two, three. Exactly, but you got to give credit to Tepper for doing what he can to limit the damage. First offering to Marcus Brown is down low for ball one from Joey Ryan at 91 miles an hour from the hard-throwing right-hander from Norwood, Massachusetts. Taylor shading in at third as Ryan pumps in a strike, and it's one and one. Well, in the ninth inning, you take outs any way you can. Forced him, forced Garibay to go the other way again. Taylor was underneath it. One, one. In for a strike, and it's one and two. Commodore defense playing Brown to pull on the right side. Both Mooney and Walsh playing fairly deep. Yeah, Got to be careful going back to the inside again after he did so on two straight pitches. Brown today 0 for 3 with a walk. 1-2 fouled right side. Well, you said it. They're playing for him to pull. Had a single back in the seventh, and... That single was indeed to right field. Brown coming into the day two for seven. So now hitting 200 on the summer. 
And Ryan's 1-2. Tapped foul off the plate again, and Chatham shortstop giving Ryan a good battle here. And that's all you can ask for when you're down by one if you're Chatham. Extend, extend. Now you need him to extend the barrel of the bat, but Ryan wants that K right here. A one, two. Swing and a miss. Ryan gets Brown swinging, and there's out number two in the top of the ninth. Matthew Hogan now steps in as Chatham's last out to play with. He entered the game as a pinch hitter in the top of the seventh and drew a walk. And the Angler's hoping that he can offer a repeat performance here in the ninth or otherwise get on against Joey Ryan. First pitch low, and it's 1-0. and He drew that walk back in the seventh inning, kept that inning rolling. So Joey Ryan trying to just switch it up, make sure it doesn't does not end up like the seventh. The 1-0. In for a strike, and it's 1-1. One and one. The Commodores trying to avoid their worst four-game start since 2011 when they started 0-7. Last time they started 0-4. And, and now the 1-1. One Check swing on the outer half, and Hogan did not go. It's 2-1. and one. It took the Doors until mid-July last summer to win their first home game. Let's see if they can come away with one now. In for a strike, and the Anglers down to their final strike. Two and two, two down, base is empty. Five to four, the Commodores lead, and they're a strike away from their first victory of the 2022 summer. The 2-2. Two -two. Swing and a miss. Joey Ryan comes in and closes the door, and the Commodores escape with a 5-4 win at home. They take down the Chatham Anglers, and victory is oh so sweet. It's win number one for 2022. We said it before the game. We felt it. They did a good job. Give credit to the bullpen. Yeah, he gave up two runs, but Tepper, Ryan, Levi Wells did a great job. He will be in line with the victory. But fantastic win for the Commodores. Commodores, 5-4 to four victory over the Anglers. They scored early. They scored often in those early innings, and that was enough through the remainder of the game to squeak out a one-run victory over their Eastern Division foes. The Commodores will be back tomorrow. They head on the road to play the Hyannis Harbor Hawks. So we'll be back at 6 p.m. for more broadcasts for the Commodores. So tune in then to hear what Falmouth does then. And they'll take their 1-3 and three record out there to play Hyannis. But for now, Commodores finish off a win here at home. And that'll be it for us tonight. Carter Bainbridge, along with Logan Soforenko and Trey Redfield, our field reporter, closing things out here at the Gov with the Commodores' victors for the first time this summer.